being here this week, and uh, it's been encouraging and exciting to have a part. And I appreciate the the invitation to come and preach. And just uh, I, I talked to Pastor Stephen just earlier in the week. We went out, took us out, and and uh, down to town. We had some lunch and some things. And I just uh, I said, boy, you've been so gracious to to me and my wife, and uh, also the Corleys were there, but just so gracious. He said, well, it's a gracious church, yes. and uh, it, I appreciate your kindness and your your love for the Lord. And you know, when you love the Lord, you love the Lord's people, yes. and uh, that's that's how it works. And uh, so, I just want to thank you, uh, my wife and I. We're just very thankful for how gracious and kind you've been. We do love this church. We've had a connection with it just because uh, when I went to uh, down there, the uh, pastor that had been there, Pastor Johnson, uh, eventually came up here and and got this restarted. And uh, so I've always had a connection with him. Uh, for a number of years, and uh, so I've all he, he's had me here a time or two be, while he was here. So I just am thankful to be here, watching what God's doing. Uh, really, it's pretty exciting uh, where you're at in your missions, giving and a great goal. And I'm trusting uh, the Lord is going to be glorified by what you determine what what you determine He wants you to do this year. So. Um, Amen. So uh, we're going to open to Acts 11. It's really, I just want to touch on a text here. It's not really my text. Um, I, uh, I'm i going to preach this morning on faith, promise, giving. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's not often a very popular topic to preach in a Baptist church, uh, giving, you know, but I, I knew I needed to preach on it this week as I was coming, I, or that I felt like the Lord would have me to. I, I thought about doing it earlier in the week um, when it might not be so well attended and uh, I'd only get hurt, injure a few, make a few folks mad at me, but I don't have any intention to make you mad and I don't think it will. Uh, but you know, um, the Lord seemed to lay it upon my heart as the messages came together uh, to do these messages on, a, on Sunday. And um, and so, um, it, one pastor was preaching in his church, and uh, he was uh, preaching uh, about this matter of giving, and uh, it, it, that was his message, but he had an outline, and he was uh, preaching to the church, and somewhere in his outline, his first point was, uh, as he began to preach, he said, now, let the church walk. And he had a deacon that supported him sitting on the front row, and he said, Amen, preacher, let it walk. And he got a little farther in his message, going down in his outline, and, and he said, Let the church run. And the deacon said, Amen, preacher, let the church run. Let the church run. You reach the world. And he kept going. He said, Man, we need to let the church fly. And the deacon said, Amen, preacher, let the church fly. And the preacher said, now it's going to take some finances for the church to fly. And the deacon said, let the church walk. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, amen. Well, <laughs> Acts chapter 11, verse number 27. I'm, I'm going to preach on the, the subject this morning of why should I give to faith promise missions? And uh, asking you, having you ask that question, why should you do that? You know, you may even be sitting here saying, well, preacher, I understand tithing. I, God, I tithe. I'm a, I'm a tithing church member. But man, the way things are today, as, as expensive as stuff is, I, there's just not anything extra in my budget uh, for, for missions. And uh, that's what I want to preach on this subject to you this morning. Um, some people would even argue to you, you know, hey, you can't even show me, uh, you can't show me in the Bible where it says faith, promise, missions, giving. And, uh, you know, uh, you, I can't show you those words. But I can show you the principle and the concept. I, I can show you that. And I, I desire to do that this morning. And we preached uh, this week about the church 
and uh, the, the responsibility that the church has. And uh, I, I think what I'm showing you here is the, uh, at least in the New Testament church, I'm showing you an example of uh, here in these verses of this matter of faith promise giving. And um, we, we talked about the church at Jerusalem, how that that's where the Lord told the disciples to wait till they were filled of the Holy, till the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they were empowered to go into uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And remember, we spent some time talking about how the church at Jerusalem just exploded. I mean, the God when the Holy Spirit came upon. And they went out and preached the gospel. They added 3,000 people the first, the first Sunday. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And as you go through the chapters of Acts, you see there's 4,000 saved here, 5,000 saved here. You get to chapter 6, and it says the disciples were multiplied. They're not even counting them anymore. There's just too many. I believe maybe that church in Jerusalem was... Uh, you know, 25,000 people had been saved through that ministry or so. But we went to Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, and up to that time, they really had not reached out. Right. They had stayed in Jerusalem, preached to Jews, took the gospel only to Jews, and the Bible says that persecution arose in Acts chapter 8, and the disciples were scattered. And it talks about they were scattered into Judea and Samaria. They, took, they had to leave because the persecution there in Jerusalem was so great. And it says in Acts 8, 4, they, they went everywhere preaching the word, taking the word of God. Where they went, they took the word of God. And it's like God said, hey, I'm going to make missions happen. I'm going to allow this to come in the church, and I'm going to make it happen. And, and that's what happened. The gospel spread. And you remember, it went up to a place in Syria, the church at Antioch, up in north of Jerusalem. And it went up there, and uh, they heard about what was going on. Up there, they began to preach to Grecians, non-Jews. They preached, they gave the gospel message to Gentiles, and guess what? They believed it. They got saved, they got changed, and, and man, the church began to grow. They sent Barnabas up there from Jerusalem to check out what was going on, make kind of figure out man they've heard about it back in Jerusalem and he saw the hand of God upon him and he went to, to, to go pick up Paul in Tarsus and said man you need to come back his name was Saul at that time and he brought him back and they taught and preached in that church and the church began to grow and if you'll look in Acts chapter 11 verse 27 and if you're able if you'll stand with me we're just going to read a short text and and this is just kind of I, what I want to show you is that very early what we see is this this matter of faith promise giving verse 27 it says and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight, for, or thank you today for the word of God. I pray that you'd help me, and you help me to be say everything, Lord, you have said today, and you help me to just not say anything of my own volition, but Holy Spirit of God, I pray you move and work in this place. We love, love you, Lord, for what, who you are and for what you've done and how good you are to us. May you be honored and glorified. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Got ahead of myself there. I don't plan to preach this long, uh, but uh, it might be supper instead of dinner, lunch, I guess. Uh, but what I want you to see here is this, that you can see that there, uh, these prophets came up to Antioch, the church had grown, people were being saved, and this prophet uh, preached, prophesied that there was going to be a great dearth, a drought uh, throughout all the world. And... Uh, these guys had heard of the need of the saints in Judea, south in Israel, around the Jerusalem, the southern part of Israel. And they got burdened in their hearts, and 
every man according to his ability, they, they put together an offering and uh, to send relief unto the brethren uh, that were in Judea, and they sent it by Barnabas and Saul to Jerusalem to give it to them. And this is early, right after they had scattered up there, the church at Antioch had been started, and that's what you see right there in this passage of Scripture is the beginning of what we call faith promise. We're eventually going to get to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 where we're going to look at it and I'll show you that. But I want you to see that this matter of faith promise giving which is above and beyond your tithe and other offerings you might give. We have an others offering in our church that sometimes some of our older missionaries have passed away. Their, their wives are still, uh, they've kind of been on uh, support and their husbands passed away and they're kind of, um, you know, they've been by their husband all these years. And so a lot of times we try to take an others offering that we try to use to keep support there and use our missions money for church planting and, and missions works and things like that. But we, we don't want to forget the ladies. And, and so those sort of things, those are other offerings that you have in the church. And, and I don't know if you're a part of a back, this church that there are needs and you give to those things and, and thank God for you. That, that's part of loving the Lord. But listen, Faith promise missions giving is something that God uses to allow you to support these missionaries and to do some things. I mean, Stephen was telling me what you did for the Philippines, for the Christian school in the Philippines. How exciting is that? That you, you bought books for a whole school. We, we got a little school. I'm telling you, it's, just, it's pricey to have books uh, to, to do those sort of things. And... And, you know, that is just a, it's a marvelous thing for us to be able to do, help those things. We, we helped the work in Nepal a little bit this last summer when they were here, and we, we helped them with some money to build their own church in uh, uh, Kathmandu. I was trying to think of the song. Unfortunately, my mind went back to an old rock and roll song, but... <laughs> I knew that name of that town, but that's where it was. And uh, uh, forgive me, Lord, I didn't even need to throw that. That was one of those things that, you know, when I said, Lord, don't let me say that, immediately when I opened my mouth, it's like, don't do it, John. Uh, that's what, uh, but, but that's where that came from. But, you know, honestly, there's a group of believers over there that God is really using. Right. And uh, they're reaching a nation where everybody's lost. I mean, yeah. 15, 20 years ago, nobody would ever heard of Jesus Christ. Right. And you have a part in that, like I told you in Sunday school. Yeah. Somebody from there is going to go to the accounting office in heaven and say, Ah, oh, so-and-so has been a faithful giver. I'm going to go see them, tell them. Hey, they live in Florissant, man. <laughs> they were in the mountains like I was in Nepal. Yeah. And I got saved. Because you sent Brother Travis, you sent Brother Corley, you helped them. Thank God. And so that's what we want to look at. And I want to show you, first of all, the reason we do it is because it's a Bible thing. It's not a gimmick for preachers to raise more money. It's not, uh, go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. It's not, but Stephen's already mentioned it this morning, it is not about the blessings that come from it. It is not a seed faith. That is, you do this, God will do this. There's no guarantees. Like God will bless you. You will please God, but there is none of that. If you've if you got that in your mind, that is not faith promise. That is not what we are talking about when we speak about faith promise missions. Chapter 4 of Philippians. So we see that it's a, it's a biblical concept. It's biblical that, to help, that those who give to help others to hear the gospel, that they will be blessed by God. Chapter 4 here, and uh, we'll go all the way back to verse 10, and I'll, I'll speed up here. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul says, I don't need anything. I'm okay. The Lord will take care of me. He says, I know both how to be abased. I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Then he says this, notwithstanding, ye have well done that you did communicate with me, or that you did communicate with my affliction. So they heard about it. He's in prison writing this. But he says this, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me. And here's what this word communicated means. It doesn't mean talk or send a letter. No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. You did. Paul started the church at Philippi on his second missionary journey. God brought him in there to Philippi. It was a Roman colony up in uh, it, it, we, where we would say northern Greece. It's in Macedonia. And uh, he, they brought him in there. And uh, Paul went in and he went to this town. And like his custom had been in the first missionary journey, uh, he, he would have liked to have gone to a synagogue on the, on the Sabbath day. But Philippi had no, no synagogue. So... There weren't enough Jews. That probably meant there weren't enough Jewish men. He had to have 10 Jewish men to have a synagogue, so there weren't enough of them. But Jews that were in a place where there was no synagogue, a place where they would meet and hear the scriptures, if they didn't have a synagogue, they often went somewhere where there was water. And so Paul went down by the river. And down by the river, he found some ladies there. One of them's name was Lydia, seller of purple. And he preached the gospel. And the Lord opened her heart, and she believed. Then, of course, they cast the demon out of the, the young girl there in Philippi and, and who was given stock tips to the guys she was able to pro, <laughs> prognosticate and they were making money off her. And oh, She kept following Paul and Barnabas around. Paul cast the devil out of her. And man, when, when the, she, she lost the devil, she lost the ability to, to tell the, uh, the, the, what stocks or whatever they were to invest in. I'm kind of bringing 20th century in. But, but in that sense, they were making money off her because she had a demon spirit that was helping her to prognosticate things and they were making money off her. When that happened, man, they got upset and they turned Paul and Barnabas in. These stupid street preachers, look what they did. Messed up our whole lives. And they threw him in jail. They beat him. They beat him. That's when God, at, at midnight, Paul and Barnabas are laying in, sitting in the stocks, beaten and bloody, and they start singing praise to God. God sends an earthquake throws open the prison doors and uh, the Philippian jailer comes in. Yep. He says uh, he was going to kill himself. Right. And he says, don't do yourself no harm. And he says, sirs, what do I have to do to have what you got? Right. And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in that house. And he got saved. And that church was made up of Lydia, that little demon, that former, formerly demon possessed lady, the Philippian jailer, and numbers of others. Yes, and when Paul left there and went to Thessalonica and Corinth, and, and he began to make his way, Berea began to make his way through Macedonia, Corinth, and Achaia down in southern Greece, this church found out where he was. And he said, Let's send him some money. They found somebody that was going where he was. They said, will you give this to Paul for us? Right. And they communicated with him. Right. And Paul here is commending them for what they did. He said, verse 16, I, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Right. He says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, your gift. Watch this. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, and look at this word, well-pleasing to God. Well-pleasing to God. It's, it's God's plan that we send the gospel. I've already kind of touched on that this week. The, the commission that, that Jesus gave, go ye into all the world and, 
and teach, uh, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It can only be fulfilled by a local church. But the problem is, how do we get from our Jerusalem to our Judea, uh, Colorado, our, our Colorado? How do we get to Samaria, our country, the United States? How do we get to the uttermost part of the world? How do we get to the Philippines? How do we get to Ireland and Germany? And, and how, how do we do that? You're to do it both. You're to be witnesses both. At the same time, you can only do it through missionaries. It's the only way the commission can be fulfilled. And that's how they did it in the first century. We made mention of this. And that's how this church and our church does it in the 21st century. We do it basically the same way. We have a little more technology. We can get to where we need to go a little earlier, a little faster. Uh, probably not cheaper, but a little faster. And, uh, but the truth is, that's how it's done. Yes, sir. Well, yes, God sir. has not changed. Right. Uh, you're not I, the internet's a wonderful thing. You, people, I've heard people getting saved on the internet, but that's not the way. It, it can be a way you reach out, but it is not the standard. The standard is for someone to go you, and preach the gospel. Yes, we want them to be saved, and you can get saved off the internet, but you can't get baptized on the internet. <laughs> And it is a command. It is part of the commission. It's not part of salvation. But it is identifying with Christ. And it is identifying with His church. And then you're to be taught all those things. To, you're, you're to be taught to go do the exact same thing that happened to you. Give somebody the gospel. Right. And that happens through local churches. And it needs to happen all over the world. Right. And that's what he's speaking about. And so he's talking to them about that. Co commending them with that it's a sweet smell. And then I want you to see this. Verse 19. But my God, Paul says, your sacrifice, your communication was a sweet smell. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. That promise. I can't tell you what he'll give you, but I can tell you this. He will, when you give to missions... He promises to supply all your need. Amen. And it's not according to what's going on in this earth. It's according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Right. But I want you to notice the context of it. It's, about, it's in the context of giving so Paul can do the work of the ministry. It's in the context of missions giving. It's not just a context necessarily for every believer. He said, hey, your sacrifice was well-pleasing, an odor well-pleasing unto God. That's what God loves. It's given to a church who gave to a missionary who nobody else would give to. And that's where Paul, under the, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit through Paul, wrote this down. So faith promise, faith promise, you should give to faith promise because it's biblical. Turn back now to the book of 2 Corinthians, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse number 6. Why else should you do give to faith promise? Well, the second reason is found here in verse, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. And I, I don't mean to rip things out of context. It's just a big passage and, and I'm going to try to go in a little bit here. But I want to just show you some principles of this. Faith promise allows you as a believer in Jesus Christ and it allows churches to experience in a positive sense the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. Verse 6. But this I say, Paul's, Paul's writing here, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. You know, uh, reaping and sowing, there's a negative sense to this spiritual law. I mean, Paul even says it here, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But we usually use it from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He says, don't, you, don't think you can do what you want and there's not consequences. We usually preach it like that as a Baptist preacher. But here, Paul is using it in relation to this matter of faith promise. In this specific sense, 
It is this offering that was going to the poor saints of Judea in Jerusalem from a church in Corinth, which is down in Achaia, southern Greece, and also the churches of Macedonia. They're collecting money, all these Gentiles, to send back to Jerusalem to those poor saints in Judea the, the, where, the, where the gospel came from. He's kind of pointed to them in another past that you're a debtor to me. But what he's, what he's talking about is this. I, I, we're taking an offering, and he, he's just speaking to him. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Man. So that's what he's talking. You reap. There's a positive aspect of that. Do you, you know this reaping and sowing? Uh, the, the principle of it is this. You, you, it's just a simple gardening thing or a farming idea. But you know that you always reap more than you sow. I mean, you put a couple kernels of corn in the ground, and I don't know if you can grow corn up here, but yeah, I think you can. Okay, it's I don't know how cold it is, but but if you if you put you know, I, I, we plant a garden every once in a while. It had been a while, but you put a kernel of corn in there, and uh, you know, over time you'll get four or five years, yeah. and it multiplies by a hundredfold. Why does God use that? Because He wants you to understand you, you, when you sow, and you sow in a positive sense, you reap more than you sow. But he also says here you reap in proportion to what you sow. Yeah. You know, the chances are if you only throw three or four grains of corn out, you, you, you may be lucky to get a stalk of corn because the other two may not make it through the your rabbits get them or something like that. The other thing you have to understand is you reap after you sow. Yeah. Now, don't misunderstand me. We've already dressed it two or three times this morning. You don't think that I put 10 bucks in, it's going to multiply. In a sense, it is going to multiply. But it may be in the sense of souls. It may be two or three people believe off of the, the New Testament you provide with that 10 bucks. Okay? It may be that way. But I want to give you a promise from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6 and verse 9. It, the writer said this. He said, But beloved... We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Though we thus speak. And here's, here's he's dealing with in the context of that. I don't mean to rip it out of context. But he says this. For God is not unrighteous to forget our work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And so it's not necessarily, I don't know that it's necessarily talking about giving in that passage. I'm sure it includes it. It's just talking about ministering to others. And he says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto, uh, unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. But the idea is this, God does not miss anything. I mentioned in Sunday school, God's a great bookkeeper. He keeps track and he knows. And so faith promise, faith promise allows you to experience in a positive sense, the good sense, the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. Look down a little bit. Look down to verse number 7. So here's his command. In verse 6, This I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The next third reason you ought to participate is this. Faith promise is a free will offering from the heart. Yes. That God here says he wants every man to purpose. And that word man doesn't mean... It's not used in that sense. It's not male. It's everybody. Yes. Man, woman, young people, boys, girls. It's for everyone. And he wants every believer in a local church to participate in. That's the idea of this. Every man. He want, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how much income you've got coming in. It doesn't matter. Right. He is saying this to every person. He is saying, listen, just purpose in your heart. Let every, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. I've got to, I didn't bring it. I was looking through some of my mission stuff yesterday. 
You know, <laughs> it was a uh, it was kind of cute to watch Brody come on running up here with that uh, dollar bill, and uh, <laughs> he wasn't he couldn't wait for you to get back there. Amen. He, he, he couldn't wait on the offering plate. He wanted to put in what he had. God loveth a cheerful giver. That's what it says there. But you know what? It doesn't matter. I, we got a faith promise card. I mean, we don't sign ours either, but. A little girl signed one a couple of years ago, and uh, she's she's an older young lady in the church and faithful. But she uh, she signed, she put ten bucks a week. Man, man. She doesn't work. She's still in school. I, I imagine she probably she gets some birthday money and things like that. Yeah. Well, I've had them for a quarter. You know, if you have little children, you should teach them this yes. matter of learning to give to the Lord. Preach. Preach. They can, God wants them to learn this. Yes. It, it doesn't matter. See, every man, every person, as they purpose in their heart, so let them give. What, what, does, what does that mean, that matter of purposing in your heart? Well, it, it really is a matter of this. What God is saying is prioritize this matter of missions. Yes. How important is it? That's good. The, the word that is used there, Strong's Dictionary, defines it like this. It means to choose for oneself before another thing, to prefer. That's what that idea of purposing in your heart. God wants you to take that. I left mine there, but he wants you to take that card and he wants you to seriously get with him yes. and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Maybe you already know. Maybe you should come to him before you already determine, because this is what happens. We say, well, let's look. Okay, we can do this. Right, right. Yeah. That's not what this is about. It's not. It's not about getting money in the plate. It's not about making 51000 go up to you know, 70000 It's not about that. It's about you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, saying, God, I want people around the world to have what I have in Jesus Christ. Yes. And, and I don't know, I, 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 you haven't called me to go. If you, if you want me to go, I'll go. But God, I want to do something. What do you want me to do? Amen. Let him tell you. Let him show. And one of the ways that is, is as you purpose in your heart, you're probably saying, man, there's just no money to go around. We're going in the hole every... I know folks are, you know, that's a big deal going around on the in news and radio. Everybody, their credit card debt is going up. God doesn't want you to charge... But I doesn't want you to charge your missions. You know, I don't think you take credit cards for that. But, uh, but the idea is this. He wants you to say, well, wait a minute. You know, there are, we cut back all the time, don't we? Yeah. I mean, you know, if I think about the expense of Diet Dr. Thunder, she, she drinks the, the generic brand, but if I think about the expense of Diet Dr. Thunder, we could cut back a, a little each week. If, honestly, we go out and eat, a, we go eat burger or fries every week. We go out on a kind of a date after groceries, and we spend between 20 and $25 just a, just a meal before we go home to... But you know what? $25 a week, that's $100 a month. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, 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 uh, those are things that what we're talking about here. Don't, don't approach the faith promise offering as giving that which is convenient to give. Yes. That which you can afford. What the idea is is this. God, your, your pastor, the, the reason it happens is he wants you to wrestle with God. Now, be prepared when you wrestle. It's, it's strenuous. And sometimes what God says, you say, I, I can't do that. I've said that. That's why I know that. But, but I've been able to do that. Stuff that I thought he, I couldn't do. I, I've been able God does that. God wants you to wrestle with Him in prayer. Right. And, and let me show you something. You're here in chapter 9. Look over to chapter 8. 
He wants you to give sacrificially from what you have. Chapter 8, verse 11. He's talking about this same offering. He says, Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. And what I'm saying here is, don't put, I'm going to give $100,000 to missions. Because right. God's going to give it to me first and then I'm going to, that's not, that's presumption. Yeah. That's presumption. Yeah. Be, that's not what He wants. He wants you to really get with Him and seek Him. I, I, I'm telling you, if you'll do this, if you'll really get your heart... Now, you really have to be a tither. You have, to, you have to be a giver already. You have to be committed. You can't give it in place of your tithe. You really have to already do the 10% and, and uh, be involved in offerings. But if you really want to get involved in this and you really want to see God work in your life and push you and stretch your faith like we talked about as He did with Abraham, then you're going to have to get a hold of Him. And you're going to have to let Him, let him work in your heart and show you. See, we want to give what we're able to give, but we don't want to wrestle with the Lord. And we don't want to ask, what does the Lord really want me to do? Don't work God into your budget. Give God your budget. Man. Say, here you go. What have I got here that God, I, I could probably do without? That I could use. I'm telling you, that's sacrificial giving. Because it, it gives you the chance to reprioritize. We live in a world, and we've been told this world communicates to us that it's all about me and what I want, and making myself happy, and doing what I enjoy. And God says, No, that's not how it works. It's, it's not about you, it's about them, it's about Him overall. But His heart is them. It's about them. Now, let me tell you, if you if you could put away a meal a week or a hamburger going out to eat once a week, or you could put away uh, Starbucks coffee or whatever, you, you, we, we all have things like that that we do. If you could uh, if you could quit giving Apple extra payments so you got more room for your for your uh, photographs and things like that, and uh, uh, if you could do those sort of things, I'm picking, uh, that came to my mind, because I pay that every, <laughs> my wife's an Apple person. So, uh, I'm, I'm dropping hints here, our faith promise doesn't come for a while, but, uh, but I'm not God, amen? So she doesn't have to, she doesn't have to listen to me, and that's that, she just has, she has to get with the Lord. But, but that's what I'm saying, it's a chance to say, God, I want you to be pleased with my life. I want my giving to be a sweet savor in your nose. I want you and to, to be pleased with what it is I'm doing. Let me hurry. One, two more. Chapter 9, verse 8. Oh, I'm sorry. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Fourth reason why faith promise, you ought to give to it. Faith promise giving allows a church and individuals within that church to experience the power of God. Wow. Because really when you wrestle with Him, you're going to be brought to a place, and it's normal to be brought, you're going to be brought to a place, say, I don't think I can do this. But our God, it, notice what it says there, verse 8, and God is able. It's possible. God, it's, it's that idea. With God, it's possible. Now, the Scripture says that with, that with God, nothing is impossible. Luke chapter 1, when he was speaking to Mary, the angel spoke to, to Mary, hey, it's not God, with God, nothing's impossible. God's all-powerful. He's over the laws of nature. He, he created those. He governs it. And so we don't, we don't have to worry, but why does that matter? Because when it comes to this matter of missions and you're listening to me, you say, yeah, I should be involved. I just can't do it. We're not asking you to do it. That's right. 
We're asking you to ask God how you can do it. Right. That's what it's speaking of. If, if you pass this by over and over again, you'll miss getting to experience God doing something yes, sir. Yes, sir. in your life that you'll remember. Your pastor's already shared. I, I was, but how many times have you given to this and, you, and you've got a testimony right. yeah. of what God has done? I, I have people all the time, when they get a hold of this in the church, they come and say, after a couple of months of doing this, they say, Pastor, you're never going to believe. On faith promise, I, I told my wife, we cannot do and but we prayed and we did this, and you, guess what happened at work this week? <laughs> the whole faith promise we promised for a year, God gave it to us in a monthly raise. Wow. Wow. So that happens sometimes. Yes, it does. Sometimes you're expecting a big expense and it doesn't happen. Yes, sir. And sometimes you find yourself in a spot and God acts in a way through someone else. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you think, why would you do that for me? Because God is able. God is able. Let me show you one more thing. Look over in chapter 8. Faith promise giving is a true statement of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Chapter 8, verse 8. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Amen. Do you see what Paul said there in verse 8? He says, I speak not by commandment. I'm not ordering you to do this. You don't have to do this. You don't. It's not a command. But God's not going to make you. Your pastor's not going to make you. There's no place for a name on there. Nobody's calling you. you. You don't have to do this. But it's obvious there's a need. And it seems pretty obvious to me as I read my Bible, this is how God means for these needs to be met, how the gospel is to spread. In our case, it's a reminder that somebody came... Uh, and brought the gospel to you. Even if it wasn't a missionary, if you trace it back far enough, somewhere, if somebody got the gospels, somebody sent someone. Yes, sir. And they may have brought it to your parents, and your parents led you to the Lord, and things like that. But somewhere back down the line, you can point it back. And somewhere somebody sacrificed to send somebody to a community in, in Colorado or New Mexico or, or uh, Texas or somewhere, and a preacher came and began to go door to door and happened to catch your grandma or your mom or dad or caught you at the door, and you gave them an opportunity and they preached the gospel, and you're, you were saved. Yes, sir. And from that moment, your life changed forever. Yeah. That, that's that idea of this matter. He, it is talking about the, this idea that there's a need. It's not by commandment. And Paul says, I speak by the occasion of the forwardness of others. And earlier in chapter 11 or 8, he gives uh, examples of the churches of Macedonia. They were suffering in great trial of affliction, but they, they said, no, you have to take our offering. He says, man, you guys are you're poorer than those people in Judea. Yeah. And they said, no, you take it. And he said, we didn't want to, but we did. Yeah. And he, he talked about they did so by the grace. He said, I do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That's that idea, I think, that he's talking. He said, I'd speak to you because of the forwardness of others. These folks of Macedonia have already done it. They're waiting on you, folks in Corinth. That's what he says. So this offering's not a commandment. You don't have to give it. But your t participation in it does prove the sincerity of of our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And the example Paul gives in verse 9 of this matter of sacrificial giving is Jesus himself. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for my sake, for your sake, he became poor. That we, me, you, through his poverty, might be made rich. I'm a child of the king. Yes, sir. It may not look like it, but, but I am. <laughs> I, I am. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything you see, it's his. I'm his kid. I was adopted. And I was adopted because he sent his only son in my place. See, that's why when I think about missions, I, <clears throat> I remember what the Lord Jesus did for me. I have noticed sometimes in my own children, they grew up in a Christian home, they grew up in church all the time. And they sometimes worry, I, I have a, my testimony, God really saved me out of a mess. My kids aren't a mess, and sometimes they talk like, well, Dad, I don't have a great, and I said, man, what do you mean you don't have a great? Testimony. Right. Yeah. Right. You were a sinner. <laughs> you were living in a preacher's home and you were a little rotten sinner and I can testify to it. <laughs> but God saved you. Yes. He redeemed you. He kept you from a life of junk. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. Our God is so good. Yes, sir. Amen. And the idea is, listen, it shows you love Him yes. when you give so others can hear about Him. Yeah. Look again, verse 10. So here Paul says it's not a commandment. So he says, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do but also to be forward a year ago. He says it's expedient for you to do it. Expedience means it's profitable for you. Yes. Paul says, it's not, I'm not commanding you, but here's my advice. It's good for you to do this. Yes. It's good for you to be involved in this. The greatest giving in Scripture is sacrificial giving. Yeah. It's something God showed when He sent His Son, His only begotten Son. It's something Jesus showed when He came and gave His life. It's not something you have to do. It's something you choose to do. And one of the reasons you should choose to do it is because you love the Father, you love the Son, and you love the Spirit. And you want to be involved in what they're involved in. L listen, it, it's not the value of the gift that you give is not so much in the amount. Right, right. But in the consideration of your heart. And what how you have wrestled with God to come to what it is he wants you to do. If you'll obey him and you'll give, it's a sweet smell. In the nostrils of the Lord. Amen. Oh, Stephen, why don't you come?